Hello everyone and welcome to Grab Mini Summit uh, 2020. Uh, my name is Pat Krull and I will moderate this event. Um, let's start with uh, some short introduction to the Mini Summit where I will tell you about agenda, about who we, ha who we have here. And um, yeah, let's, let's start with the, with the event. So maybe we'll, we will start with 3MDEP, uh, one of the organizers uh, of this event. Um, I'm the founder of 3MDEP. Um, so 3MDEP is an uh, open source uh, firmware consulting company. Uh, we are recognized as a core boot license service provider since 2016. We are a core boot project, project leadership participants. We also, since 2018, UFI adopters, uh, official consultants for uh, FWPD uh, LVFS, Yocto participants and embedded Linux experts, as well uh, as uh, enthusiasts and evangelists of open source firmware. So um, I'm core boot contributor and, and maintainer, uh, conference speaker, uh, as well as organizer and co-organizer. Also trained at various organization, former Intel bio software engineers, 12 years in business, and six, uh, since six years, I, I'm contributing to open source firmware and trying to push open source firmware uh, on every possible device and reduce binary blocks. Um, with me, uh, we have uh, Daniel Kipper from Oracle, software developer. Um, one of the Grab upstream maintainers, also uh, Zen boot code developer, as well as trench boot technical leader uh, inside Oracle. Um, bef before that work, um, Daniel did a um, uh, lot of work on kexec, kdump, uh, make dump file, crash tool, and, and uh, memory hot plug development. And uh, uh, also we have Vladimir PH coder uh, Serbienko, who is also uh, upstream a maintainer of Grab, and uh, we probably will have uh, Alexander Burmashev from Oracle, as well as other 3MDEP team members um, who will support this event. Maybe a little bit about history of the event. So this event, the idea of this event born uh, around mid 2019, when, when we met with Daniel um, as a part of um, Linux Plumbers conference and, and uh, event organized by Daniel Matthew Garrett, um, and we decide that because we have mutual uh, interest in trench boot and, and there is use of grab there, um, we decide to create some small event when we can exchange ideas. Um, so initial concept was just to talk about trench boot, uh, but it quickly grow up because it happened that 3MDEP as an embedded consulting company uh, uh, touch grab uh, very open and firmware bootloader boundary is very interesting to us and it would be great to have a place where we can talk about that. So first mini summit was in December 2019. It was one day, uh, one day uh, meeting between Daniel and 3MDEP team. We had six, six presentations, the discussions and summary um, of that is in blog post, uh, which you can find on a, in the link uh, on the presentation. Um, all talks were recorded. You can find those all on YouTube. Um, and there was also associated blog post, which kind of described what, what problems we have and how we plan to uh, move that forward. Uh, so this year, uh, of course, we have changed of the situation a little bit. Uh, so mini summit was changed to the remote event uh, because of the COVID. Um, we also have like more guests. We have like external part uh, participants um, and everything is streamed on, on YouTube uh, as you're watching it now. Um, other contributors, uh, Oracle, um, Daniel also represents Oracle, um, and Nine Elements Cybersecurity, who will have presentation uh, about um, USB support in Grab. So thank you for other contributors. Um, so what, what are the goals of this mini summit? Uh, first of all, we want to build place where we can, as a community, can discuss uh, Grab to related issues and, and future ideas. Uh, we can uh, connect with people which have different perspective on bootloaders, especially from the bottom and from the uh, higher layer. So from bottom, bottom side, especially open source firmware community members, uh, which whom um, bootloaders developers can discuss uh, the interface and what are the problems between those two um, realms. Then we have Grab2 developers who can announce and say what are the plans for the Grab, uh, what was done in last year, and then we can also discuss usage and features, how, how those features should be used 
and how it can be used. And then we have operating system developers uh, who leverage Grub to features in various environments and how the uh, bootloader to operating system protocol should should work. And yeah, of course, like uh, we we also will discuss uh, what happened since last mini summit, uh, what we were able to achieve, and then what are the future ideas for, um, for example, you know. I'm thinking about converting this this event to maybe broader discussion about bootloaders and and thinking about doing bootloaders mini summit. Uh, we will we will see how this can work. Um, and by the way, you know, I started to think, okay, what's bootloader? Uh, because because like um, different different um, vendors, different entities in the ecosystem have different definition of bootloader, someone saying that U-boot is bootloader, someone saying core boot is bootloader, um, someone saying this is open source firmware, maybe this is not the same, or maybe this is overlapping. Um, and the other thing is what's the bootloader market share? Uh, Grab is very popular, it's almost on every laptop uh, which boot Linux, uh, so definitely Grab probably has a major of the market share, but there are probably others uh, playing the role on this market and and it would be interesting to talk uh, what what other bootloaders problem um, uh, exist and how we can solve those. Um, yeah, so maybe a little bit like what's Grab because like we will talk about Grab today. So for those who don't know like basic information about this project, uh, so Grab is GNU Grant Unified Bootloader. Um, it is 25 years old bootloader, like so very long history. Um, used by most of the Linux distribution these days, uh, boots, boots almost everything, leveraging most of available um, boot firmware in the world. So it can, for example, work on top of core boot, on, on top of UFI. Uh, it's 90% written in C. Um, the the uh, lines of code depends how you count it. Um, it's around 600,000 lines of code. So it's uh, quite a lot of code developed. Um, so this is basic information about Grab. How we will proceed today? Um, so the agenda for the event, um, so, so the idea is that we will do the session like at four, four and a half, um, uh, sorry, two or two and a half hour um, session at 4 p.m. Central Europe time every Tuesday uh, for whole November. So we, we will have four sessions. Uh, first session is today. Uh, so right now I started with intro, 50 minutes, 50 minutes for intro. Um, then we will have another presentation from 3M Deb from Michał Brzegowski, um, where he will talk about network boot, boot in Grab and maybe some associated problems with that. Uh, then we will have Daniel Kipper from Oracle. He will uh, present project status. Um, and then we will have ask me anything if there will be any interest in the live stream in the chat about questions. If not, then probably we will try to discuss those presentations, what's there, and you know what we think about um, how things can evolve, what's interesting um, and in those presentations. Um, okay, so uh, then 10th, 10th November 2020, uh, we still have free slot um, and and this is like the agenda is not very um, clear right now. Uh, what would be the first slot? Maybe we will sort something here. If you want to know more, please watch our social media. We will announce that. Second presentation definitely would be uh, AMD trench boot support in Graph2 and what's the status, what's the recent work. Um, we hope to have some uh, patches update there. This would be presented by me, but I believe whole team uh, in 3 mdep will support um, to uh, get the technical part done. And then of course, like we finish with discussion. Uh, then 17 November, 2020, uh, we will have nine elements, Ma Marcelo Bauer. Uh, Marcelo will uh, present an XHCI support in Grab2. Then we will uh, have Daniel Keeper, uh, who will uh, present firmware and bootloader lock specification. Uh, and as, as, as always, we will finish with discussion. And last session this month will be 24th November. Uh, we will talk about Grab2 license issues and like from perspective of embedded systems, uh, how GPL v3 uh, play with the, um, with the embedded systems and with various needs from, from various vendors. Um, and then uh, we will discuss 
um, risk five support in graph two, uh, and this will be done by by me and Michał Zygowski, and we hope to have some maybe demo. We will see, um, and then we will finish with discussion. And that's it for for the introduction. I don't know, guys. Any questions? Any anything I'm missing here? I think that's it. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you, uh, Free and the uh, folks, Piotr, Michal, uh, Camila, and Bogosia, who are helping to organize this event. This is very important uh, for the Grab, Grab community. And I'm ha happy that uh, you agreed to do that event uh, last year and this year. So this is very important for, for me and other my friends. Thanks a lot. Once again. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much for being here. And like, let's let's move this forward. So I believe if there is no um, additional uh, discussion, let's let's move on with the presentations. And I believe Michal uh, starting with the network stuff. Welcome everybody uh, to my presentation about network boot in Grab2. Um, uh, here's the agenda of my presentation. Uh, firstly, I will introduce myself, uh, who I am, um, and then I'll talk about the network boot in Grab2, uh, what we may use it for, uh, what are other implementations, um, what performance issues uh, we may face when using the network booting in Grab, um, my debugging effort, and I will compare it with the um, other most common open source implementation of uh, network booting, IPixi, and then I will conclude uh, all my presentation and uh, mention some other issues. Uh, so I am Michał Zygowski and I am a firmware engineer at FreemDev Embed Systems Consulting. Uh, I'm a Braswell SOC PC Engines and Protective Maintainer uh, in Coreboot. Also, I am its core developer. Um, I'm in mostly interested in advanced hardware features and firmware, Coreboot and uh, security solutions. So, uh, what for we use the network boot? So many times in some daily work or even at home, we often face a situation when we need some system recovery uh, because, uh, for example, hard drive was corrupted or some package did not upgrade well or for other reasons. Uh, and how often does it happen that we do not have a free storage device at hand or we have to download a live image from the network? In such situation, the network boot option may be a time server or even a life saver. So what are use cases and reasons we have for the network boot? So as I mentioned here, we may not have not a free storage device at hand, or we have to manually download the ISO file. And it consumes time because uh, you know, typically the ISO is uh, a big file and downloading takes a couple of minutes, our precious time. Also burning on not so uh, fast USB stick also takes some time. Um, another reason may be that all storage medias are filled with some important data, like we have some of our recovery images or other personal data. So uh, moving around those data to uh, make this storage empty will also consume some time. So a solution is to directly boot a kernel and possibly install a RAM disk directly uh, with our favorite bootloader and save efforts uh, on bothering with those uh, previous mentioned uh, situations. And uh, what use cases we may have with um, such network booting? So potentially, we may, for example, create some one-touch uh, installation and provisioning of certain systems. For example, we configure our standalone grab image and embed a config file, put it on, for example, a TFTP server pulled from UFI, UFI shell, and we can uh, directly uh, launch an installer of a given system. So how does the network boot uh, look like in grab? So uh, to start with, uh, we must know that there are two main types of implementations in grab2. We have uh, the legacy boot mode target, also called i386 uh, PC. And we have also uh, EFI targets, also 
I386 or X64. And what is common about those targets? Um, first of all, the Grab2 does not have an own uh, network uh, cards drivers. So it must rely on the interfaces that are provided by uh, the firmware, which is underlying those targets. So in point one, it will be uh, a legacy BIOS with uh, interrupt interfaces. And for EFI, it will be, of course, UFI protocols. So what will be different between those targets? Um, let's see. For the legacy boot mode, um, this is the most limited uh, implementation in Grub because uh, it relies on the P Pixie or UNDI API to talk with the network uh, card. So um, this, this API may be delivered only with a Pixie environment. That implies that the Grab2 must be launched by a Pixie in order to have the network working. Um, on the contrary, for EFI, um, the API is quite standardized and typically uh, the simple network protocol is used in Grab. It is available on almost every UFI implementation nowadays that is provided for uh, by IPVs. Um, it requires the network uh, UFI network stack to be enabled in the BIOS setup. And of course, the network card needs to be enabled in the setup menu. Otherwise, the necessary protocols, uh, etc., will not be available and the graph will, uh, will not talk to the uh, network card. But even though you have those options enabled, it is not always guaranteed it will work. There are some buggy UFI implementations that um, doesn't provide all the necessary um, API to, to uh, work with the network card. So, um, to uh, uh, other implementations that are available in open source are as uh, as follows. The one of the most important, I think, is the IPX. It is a network with dedicated project. Uh, it is very flexible. Uh, it has targets for many architectures, software stacks. It can be built for as an uh, legacy option ROM or EFI binary or even an ISO image. You can do almost everything with that. Um, there are also proprietary pixies, for example, like Intel drivers that are um, often included in uh, firmware images. Um, also, we have a quite fresh project called Webboot, which is a uh, this is a Go um, application writ uh, written for Linux boot purposes, which provides the network boot environment uh, for the Linux boot project in Europe. And you also have the Etherboot, JPXI. Um, this is another Pixie compliant implementation and quite good replacement for the proprietary Pixie ROMs. So uh, what issues we may uh, face with the graph network boot? Um, uh, the whole reason I have created this presentation uh, was uh, the input from Piotrkul, um from FreeMDEP. He tried to provision his uh, XCPNG installation via network, uh, create a one-touch installation, and he faced uh, very uh, serious uh, issues. He tried to use the Grub 2.04 and its TFTP or HTTP um, modules to download XCPNG kernel and boot it over the network. It occurred that the uh, network performance was quite terrible and he couldn't possibly download uh, the images in a reasonable time. So that is why um, we are here on the Grab uh, Mini Summit discussing this issue. So let's craft a simple standalone image of Grab for EFI and try to get as close as possible to the issue uh, mentioned earlier. So here I passed a few comments, which I have been using to, to build my image. I did some small trick to build a standalone image uh, with an embedded uh, config file. So I don't have to worry anymore what comments do I want to type. Um, I decided to, for example, download uh, 
uh, Linux uh, image and initial RAM disks. Uh, in this case, it will be uh, the recent uh, Ubuntu LTS uh, distribution. It is available uh, over the world. This is a public archive. So um, I just did define the uh, the mirror and the write in the path in the config file and added some debugging for uh, for this presentation purposes. And also, uh, we need here the FUNET module, which is responsible for talking with the network card over the SNP protocol, the simple network uh, protocol from UFI. So let's summarize a little bit what we will do and what we have done. So uh, this Linux kernel and initial run disk have uh, 16 megabytes in total. I have recorded some Askinema uh, that shows how it is uh, downloaded. Um, as you may see in the, in, in the ASCII cast, that uh, the initial RAM disk is not even downloaded because the destination uh, is unreachable. No, no, no idea why, because uh, the Linux kernel downloads well, but right after the uh, kernel, it's the initial RAM disk should be downloaded. Um, so measuring um, the Linux kernel uh, downloading time, um, it took about 47 seconds. For uh, 11 megabytes, it gives us 234 kilobytes per second. So a quick calculation, 16 megabytes with those speed would require over four minutes to download these images. This is not good. This is certainly there's something wrong with it. Um, after digging some some more inside the grab and enable, uh, enabling the debugging, um, it occurred that the grab is not always using the full MTU uh, in the packet transmissions. The MTU is the maximal uh, transmission uh, buffer, which is used by the network card to transmit uh, packets over the network. So I noticed that initially when the HTTP requests um, are sent, the full MTU is used. However, when the real download starts, the MTU usage starts to oscillating around 50% or even lower. Um, I have measured the, the, the period between the packets reception and uh, the average time between each packet was about 20 milliseconds. That's quite huge. Sometimes the MTU usage is higher and the receipt inter 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 intervals are lower. It is not quite consistent. So let's do some more quick calculations. Um, so for example, um, we have uh, one second per 20 milliseconds. And uh, so to calculate the uh, overall uh, speed uh, when the bug is enabled with 50% uh, usage on MTU, it gives us a uh, 37 and half kilobytes per second. So to, down, to download all 60 megabytes in debug mode, it would take almost half an hour. Wow. But how the um, speed would look like uh, in the Askinema? So um, I have calculated uh, the, uh, the period between the uh, received packets. And for non-debug mode, it is, uh, estimated on uh, 3.2 milliseconds. Well, is it reasonable or possible? Well, I don't know. Uh, a huge jump, even se seven times uh, higher uh, period between the package reception in debug mode. Well, it's more than expected. I would give max three times higher. But let's compare it with IPXE. I have also recorded um, uh, a process of downloading the same kernel and initial RAM disk. Um, it only took 70 seconds to download this uh, 60 megabytes. So it gives us about uh, three and a half megabytes per second. So I have tried to look inside the iPixie, how it looks like, uh, what drivers are used. So um, what I have uh, achieved is that um, there are many various drivers, even for the EFI targets. We have this uh, simple network protocol. We have EFI simple network protocol, EFI network identification interface, uh, and various other uh, variations. And 
I, I couldn't get hold of what is really used until I have um, enabled debug in all modules. So I noticed that typically uh, the Apex uses the either the native driver for given um, uh, network card vendor or the network interface identification protocol. Um, so it occurred that the IPX uses uh, the native Intel NIC driver for the platform I have been testing. So I had to force it to use the SNP. So I have put some return minus one in a few places and yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Well, it, I, it, I did not manage to compare it apple to apple because I wanted SNP versus SNP, yeah, IPX and Grub. But it occurred that SNP is broken on the platform. Yeah. Although I had some more uh, luck with Realtek network cards some time ago. So that's how it looked like in iPixie when I tried to use SNP. Yeah, well, let the buggy UFI implementations be with you because uh, creating something that just works is sometimes too difficult. Even for the companies that do the BIOS development for over 50 years or so. Well, quite sad. So um, maybe let's have a look like uh, a look how the network stack looks like. This is the diagram that presents the um, the network stack in the graph. So we have some basic uh, function that is responsible uh, for receiving packets, and obviously it is called receive packets. The receive packets is called for each network card that is detected and registered, and for each its driver. We all, we, at the beginning, we, we open the driver and the card, and if we uh, do not encounter an error, we just try to receive uh, 100 packets. Why 100? Well, just because I didn't found any references uh, why such number uh, is placed in the code. Then we have some suspicious uh, condition. If we received uh, 10 or more packets and we pass some stop condition, well, we return an error. Otherwise, we receive uh, the packets in the loop. If we received everything, we just return. Otherwise, uh, we increment the received uh, packets variable and um, process the packet by extracting the real data. So, well, it doesn't look uh, so complicated. It's rather simple, which is an advantage, of course. But on the other hand, um, it seems that the design is causing um, this performance downgrade because uh, it is not quite optimized to, to have a high throughput. And now um, this is the diagram of the network stack of iPixie. And what is uh, quite important, for, I think, uh, is the net step function. It is declared as a permanent process in the uh, IPX. So it suggests that this is the background process that runs constantly when IPX uh, is running and pulls for the packets and constantly receives them. So and each step uh, for, of this process call, uh, calls the net poll function. And this function, um, for each the registered uh, network cards or net devices, uses its driver to, to pull the card uh, for uh, any possible packets. It checks if the reception is uh, frozen. Um, so we wait for the packets or we freeze the network card until we, we will have some packets to receive. And then we take QE uh, the packets from the queue, which is uh, formed with the with the packets received uh, over, uh, with the UFI stack. So um, then, if we uh, receive, if we have some um, packets to the queue and uh, and process, we process them by by um, reading uh, the buffer from the network card using netRx function. And uh, if we success, we just return to the loop and try to dequeue uh, other packets. Otherwise, we um, do some diagnosis and report some errors. 
if we execute all the packets returned from the function. Um, it seems a little bit better designed uh, because we have the, the polling uh, there, which is kind of differently uh, separated from what is in grab. In grab, we have only received packets and it is polled uh, in a loop. So we don't even check whether uh, the buffer in the network card has been uh, is, is full or not. Because think about it. Is it better to to pull the card constantly and receive, for example, 50% of its real capacity, or call it rather mm, not so often, but take the fall buffer? Not that we call it the UFI stack also. So it is a software overhead to get through all these uh, jumps, functions, get to the real hardware. It is quite huge software overhead. So a few uh, conclusions uh, at the end of this presentation. So it looks like the IPXA is a superior in terms of network drivers and its performance. Well, that's not surprising. It is a network boot oriented project. On the other hand, Grub2 has other advantages and also other main tasks. So it is uh, not a real good example of comparison because Grub2 is mainly uh, designed to boot from, from uh, local storage. It's designed better to boot various systems. It is more flexible in booting systems than IPXE. IPXE is just for network booting solely. Um, uh, Grab also uh, seems to have less than 10% of the total IPX in network performance. So we have, let's say, about 250 kilobytes per second versus 3.5 megabytes per second. This difference is quite huge. So I think with have subtle changes to the Grab2 network stack or some even redesign, we could at least reach the IPX level or have some a bigger part of its performance. I have found also an interesting comment in the uh, grab code. Um, you can see the reference here, and um, it suggests that there is some field for improvement. Because as I uh, noticed earlier in the diagrams, there is the fixed number of 100 packets that are uh, received um, in a loop. This is where this comment lives, actually. And the API, as I mentioned, for polling the network arc and the IPC seems to be uh, better optimized in terms of software design. Well, the facts speak for themselves. And the software overhead is, seems to be lower than in Grab. Um, I think that results in the lower performance of the network in Grab. Um, yes, I have been uh, informed about other issues as well uh, by Piotr. Um, he used uh, the Python 3 HTTP server uh, to have some uh, testing uh, in his home lab. Uh, he set up the HTTP server to download his own some kernels or images. And it seems that uh, when Grub tries to access these images over the HTTP from this Python 3 server, the, the server crashes actually. I haven't managed to uh, find enough time to check and debug it. But it should be pretty simple because we, everybody can uh, locally set up a HTTP server and um, try to boot something from it using uh, any grab um, you have, even on your own machine. Simply typing some commands in the grab shell. OK, and uh, that would be everything from my presentation. Um, now I'd like to answer your questions if you have any. Let's see. Um, the chat is quite empty. Uh, just perhaps a small comment that thank you a lot for this pre presentation and uh, for this research. It's quite interesting information. Uh, and the reason why the performance is so low is basically because it was, uh, we have never done um, the rounds of optimizing it for a better performance. There is quite a lot of things which can be done. and. Uh, like uh, one one of the big problems is uh, our polling interval. We should probably have a, 
smaller polling interval. You have mentioned yourself that uh, packets only go every 20 milliseconds. Yes, this, but that's in debug mode. Uh, so uh, counting the, the uh, delays caused by the writing to serial port must be accounted, right? So it, yes. it does um, yes, prolong the, the is, interval. Yeah. Yes, but the thing is that we, we have only one thread in Grub. Uh, IPixi, Indeed. IPixi uh, uses, uh, can use many threads because it's only on a single platform. And so it can rely on all kinds of things like having a nor normal pitch timer and so on. But we have only single, uh, we have many platforms and not all of them in a, during the booting have actually this. And uh, as, there is quite some optimization. And we, so we have the single polling loop, which polls also for input devices, for example. Yeah, and sure. It, it should, so we sh should be able to probably to optimize it around around uh, around how we exactly we poll and uh, the the hundred packets it was just uh, something for and this comment is actually by me and it was basically ju just a number I came which came up in the first uh, first implementation and was never optimized so it's uh, it, and because one thing that we did optimize for is basically for for it to work on a different uh, systems. Like uh, we had quite some trouble with um, this this power PC, and that's obviously something we did not want to compromise on. But I completely agree that we should be able to reach uh, at least fifty percent of performance of IPX, if not more. Uh, it also must be noted that uh, Grub um, does uh, awesome work when booting uh, normal uh, images from hard disk. So the network booting is an uh, awesome addition, and it is even good to have it than not having it, right? Yes, it's, uh, it is basically under this idea that it was written, but uh, I agree that it can be proved. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with uh, Vladimir. In general, we have also other issues in the network stack. Uh, there are some related to EFI and uh, SMP oh, yeah. and MNP drivers. Uh, I, I hope that this, at least this thing, we will be able to fix after 2.06 release. This require, of course, some discussions because there are some issues which should be solved. Uh, we are also aware about other uh, issues in the network stack. It looks that uh, the, T, uh, the IP stack is not um, very well written, so I think this thing also requires some discussions. Uh, I'm aware that uh, there are at least two implementations. Sorry, did you sell, sell well, writ well written or not very well written? Not very well, well written. Uh, um, uh, I am um, uh, um, aware about at least two implementations um, which are, let's say, um, uh, can be pulled in into the grab independently. Of course, it requires some, uh, it requires, uh, uh, some uh, research how to do that, but the uh, advantage of doing this is that uh, we'll just take a code which simply works. Of course, uh, we have to check how to uh, how to integ integrate that with Grub. Uh, so anyway, uh, we are aware that uh, uh, the Grub has many uh, deficiencies and um, uh, it, uh, there is a lack of some uh, support for for uh, some uh, features. For example, there is no support for iSCSI. Am I right, uh, Vladimir? I think that there is no iSCSI. Uh, I think uh, there is no iSCSI and one other thing which we currently do not have is, for example, remote terminal. Also, we are lacking uh, crypto, although crypto is a difficult one. Network crypto, it's a difficult one and uh, because it needs a generator of random source and here is actually where where IPX or GPX, at least I checked one of them, absolutely falls flat on its face because it uses a, a fixed random number of just all zeros, which actually completely defeats the, the security protocols. So you, 
You can download over HTTPS, but this HTTPS is not actually secured. Well, okay. IPixie, IPixie has uh, um, HTTPS implementation. And by default, it uses a certificate uh, from Open Mozilla, something like this. I don't remember the exact name, but it is on their site. So you can uh, even uh, configure which images you trust and uh, whether the images should be verified after downloading. This is some awesome thing also. Uh, I don't know how, how it is uh, done with this uh, random uh, number, but for example, uh, UFI also Perfect. provides some random num number of generators, if I recall correctly. What, what provides? Um, IPXE. Yeah, but what provides random numbers generator? Oh, I, I mean, the, some UFI implementations may have some random number generators. I, I wouldn't trust UFI implementation to provide good quality random numbers. Potentially, yes. I, uh, almost, <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> also, but almost whole presentation was about UFI, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ima imagine uh, the effort to boot grab in the gacy mode over network. You have to boot grab over Pixie to have some uh, API for network booting grab. So it would be much more effort to, to even test and develop something. Okay. So, anyway, uh, we are we are complaining that there is no improvement in network stuff in, in grab. Uh, I would I have to say that there is because at least for for a few months more than well, i think than for us even more than than year we have support for dhcp v4 because for a long time uh, a crap only supported boot, boot speed so i think there is a small improvement and i hope that we'll be able to add more features to, to yes the, uh, i saw the comments for this yeah yes, so uh, from, mm -hmm. from what you're saying is um so one problem I see is um, Grab used some previous delivered network stack. So either from Pixie, either from um, from UFI. And the problem is that uh, this implementation may be suboptimal, and this is probably what they faced. And in my opinion, this is very important in the environment of provisioning new hardware, especially when we enter the land of um, uh, laptops, enterprise laptops that going to the uh, big companies. And then those companies want to have like reasonably working uh, IT uh, department. And so of course they want to automate the deployment. This is the situation that I faced when I tried to deploy kind of zero touch or one touch uh, provisioning of XCPNG. And I simply couldn't proceed with that. And one thing is Grab's side, and other thing is underlying what's what's under that. But uh, Vladimir mentioned interesting stuff: um, remote uh, remote terminal or remote console. I assume like you mean uh, gr uh, Grab menu accessible remotely. This is very yes. very interesting point. I I really like to hear more about that because. Uh, I don't know if you know, but some uh, BIOS models starting to use uh, Grab as a BIOS menu. Um, there are some, you know, some implementations of that, and there are some people that using um, this as a BIOS like Grab as a BIOS menu. This is interesting use case. And then if if that would mean that we can use Grab as a BIOS menu with remote terminal, I have to say this solves a lot of issues. As also, Piotr, regarding to the uh, problems uh, with network booting, you may also switch to the shadow. We have IPixie built in the firmware. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no more, no more problems with network performance and any other bootloaders. <laughs> As a last resort, of course, because Grab is awesome. Yeah. And, and you also mentioned the issue of not having a not having own drivers, it's uh, not per design. The design actually allows to have own hardware drivers for the for the network cards. The problem is mainly basically where do we pull those drivers from? Like uh, I had at some point I had a branch which uh, tried to pull them from GPX, but it was never finished. To one of the reasons because it is not license compatible with Grub, so it's not something which in the end we could, would be able to use anyway. Yes, uh, also there is a 
um, think about the maintenance of these drivers, right? Yes. So you have to keep maintaining them, adding uh, support for other models, etc. And, and in fact, uh, if the firmware is able to expose the interface, why should Grub really bother to implement all those native drivers? Uh, because it's not always able to. Yes, it is not always. As uh, also, I have mentioned that there is some buggy implementations that uh, SNP doesn't work or uh, other stuff. That's true. Yeah, or uh, yeah, or there, there are some some cases where you plainly do not have it at all. True. There are some, let's say, low-end uh, BIOS implementations or UFI implementations. IPv uh, IPvs d do that. For example. Uh, if, if if the customer wants to have some basic uh, firmware implementation, they cut off some parts of the firmware, and for example, you do not have the uh, UFI network stack, and you are doomed. Yeah, and also in case when you do core boot, boot plus grub, then uh, then core boot does not expose any API at all. So yes, yeah. That, that, that's the main core principle, to do what it has to do and then hand over to whatever you want. Um, yeah. So that, that's, that's, I believe, design decision of Corboot. Um, yeah. And I believe to some extent it, it's, it is a design win for some, for some solutions, um, since like Google in Chromebooks use Corboot. But um, so it is idea of... I believe in this situation, what we can use, like you have to use IPC or you have to use bootloader, which got a uh, network stack. Yes. And I think for those use cases, we could probably look into importing the drivers from somewhere. Where mm -hmm. this somewhere is, is a question. It could, it could be something like FreeBSD, like, since everybody imports network drivers from FreeBSD. Or it could be a belief payload. It's a basically it's a, since, like you you mentioned, core boot by principle does not export any API. So this, there is a library called lib payload, which is basically what you can call call API of core boot in a way. That if you want to write a payload and you need some API that would traditionally be exposed. By by the BIOS, you just link against lib payload, which has all those. Uh, yeah, so I, I I believe uh, this will change a little bit in future. So lib payload, of course, we know lib payload very well. Like we did a uh, couple implementations, uh, even in implementing hypervisor in a firmware where we have to leverage and extend lib payload. But now there is effort which is called universal payload, and universal payload. Um, is the like I believe like there there is email sent to grab mailing list, um, or at least I saw like in many places uh, a notification about universal payload approach, and if you Google that or or you will find on GitHub, um, this is something that they want to have universal interface for payload for UFI, Slim Bootloader, Core Boot, and all the firmware stacks. Uh, so I, I wonder, like sooner or later, I believe like uh, Grab may be interested in that. Well, that's uh, that's uh, something that uh, I, I guess uh, guess similar to multi-boot protocol. Mm, I didn't saw the details. I, we still have to look in the, into that. Uh, but pro I don't know. Like right? maybe. Um, yeah, it's uh, okay. Okay. It's something okay. that we had a little had in mind for multi-boot to protocol as a use case, but not pursue this use case to large degree. Mm -hmm. Grab supports the multi-boot and multi-boot two by default. Uh, whether whether you pull from the network or uh, read the images from hard disk, it doesn't matter. The protocol you use, it's still up to you. 
you can yeah. you can also choose the method you fetch the the right images from yeah the the only difference which you will end up seeing is that your multiboot payload will be able to see pixie driver it was if it was pulled by pixie through pixie so if the or rather if the grub itself was booted through pixie then also a multiboot payload will be able to see the pixie driver and this does not depend on where your payload was taken from. Okay, I will share the universal payload project uh, on the chat. So for anyone who is interested. Yeah, so you can see they, they plan to support a bunch of uh, bunch of various frameworks, uh, like firmware frameworks. Okay, guys, uh, I believe like we exhausted the topic quite uh, substantially. Um, definitely, there is some need for improvement. Um, hopefully, we can over the, the next 12 months do something with that. Um, and uh, let's see how this will work with uh, 206. And I believe like we can slowly move to the next presentation. Um, can, so maybe can you short share five the slides. Uh, yeah, sure. Like let's let's ha let's have a like short break, and we will start presentation uh, at five p.m. Central Europe time. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Kipper, and I work for Oracle. I am software developer and uh, also Grab Apps team maintainer. And today I would like to discuss uh, project status, uh, Grab project status update. Uh, so, what is the content of our presentation? At the beginning, I would like to introduce uh, shortly uh, the Grab maintainers, and then I will discuss what happened uh, last year and what is happening uh, right now. And at the end, uh, I will um, also discuss the main point, uh, the main pain points in the project, and also I will get some feedback from from the community, what is expected, and what they think about our plans and what is what is happening in this project. So, grab my tennis. Not much has changed, or at least not at all. Uh, has changed from Fosdem. We have uh, three main maintainers. Uh, Alexander Bumashev, who work for Oracle. Uh, currently, he focuses on mostly Oracle uh, Linux Grub, and also he does some work with uh, with the Shim. Uh, so, in general, he is very helpful because uh, he is able to give me some insight uh, how the um, Grub is integrated in and distributions, and we are discussing different things. Uh, with regards to that, uh, because currently the mm, the upstream in many cases is very different from uh, what is in, in the distribution. Uh, there is also uh, uh, Vladimir. Uh, Vladimir is most experienced among us, uh, so he has um, huge knowledge about, about uh, the Grab internals, uh, as you may saw from uh, last presentation. Uh, he discussed. Uh, many topics uh, sometimes I, I'm not aware of uh, because I'm not so long as project in, as, as he is in. So he is very very helpful because he knows uh, the history of the grab, uh, 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 the long history of the grab. Uh, so if I have some questions, I can approach him and he is able to uh, uh, to reply if I don't know something. And also I work as a grab uh, maintainer. Uh, I try to focus on upstream, mostly try to review most of the patches which uh, uh, which appear on the grab de grab devel. Uh, not always uh, uh, I'm able to do that on time, so sorry about that. But I hope that um, in the following months the situation will be uh, improving. Uh, we also have uh, some mm, uh, additional folks. Alexander the Graph currently uh, takes care of Rig V platform and uh, Leif uh, Lindholm uh, looks after ARM and UFI, uh, UFI code. So they are very helpful in this uh, area, but we are also looking for uh, other folks who are experienced in other areas or similar and are able to 
uh, give some uh, advices. Uh, for example, good example is Alex Stuckholt. Currently, uh, I cooperate with uh, Patrick Steinhecker with, uh, with it. He has a very big experience in this area. So he helps me to review all, all Lux patches uh, for the graph. Uh, so what happened last year? Uh, last year, maybe not a, a bit more than last year, uh, we introduced uh, Reef TV support. Alexander the graph uh, uh, did a main work with that. So graph currently has initial support for, for, for this architecture. Alexander the graph also introduced initial uh, Travis CI su uh, support in into the graph. Uh, there are also some uh, uh, patches which are appearing on the grab devel which are uh, improving this uh, this support and they are currently under review and discussion colin watson uh, from ubuntu uh, added some code which eases integration with uh, gnulib and also it eases the bootstrap of uh, uh, gnulib currently it uh, happens almost automatically uh, the GNULIP is uh, uh, downloaded uh, during bootstrap process and integrated into uh, in, in, into the grab, and um, it is quite easy at this point to move to another version of of, of GNULIP. Eric Snowberg from Oracle on the Black Focus request uh, prepared a new uh, disk driver, which uh, is which performs much better the, uh, than older one. This driver is targeted at, at IEEE 1275 uh, uh, platforms. Currently, it is used on a Spark machine, but uh, as far as I can tell, some people tested it with uh, power machines. So I think that we can expect some patches appearing on the, on the grab development at least. Uh, Jesus introduced uh, Intel MSR read write modules. This modules allows you to read and write uh, MSR registers on x86 uh, platforms. Uh, and, uh, Andrew Przerwa uh, from ARM uh, developed DHCP v v4 support. Uh, this uh, implementation was based on earlier set of patches prepared by Andrei, Andrei Bozenko. Uh, this is uh, a very nice addition because uh, up until now, uh, Grab Dev, uh, sorry, Grab only supported uh, Boot Fee protocol, which is quite outdated, let's say. So currently, we uh, uh, we support Boot Fee and the DHCP uh, in, in, uh, in IP configuration uh, protocols. Uh, John um, uh, added uh, some some code to manually build a out output for Spark 64 uh, platforms. The problem is that uh, being used maintainers at some point decided to drop a out support for uh, Spark 64. So uh, simply we were, we were not able to generate uh, uh, a out output for grab uh, on uh, newer uh, on newer being utils. So uh, John investigated how to fix that. And um, fortunately, it appeared that it is very easy to fix. The, the fix is just a few lines of code. And currently, the support for uh, Spark 64 is back into, uh, into the grab. Uh, it simply just gen generates uh, all headers uh, manually. Uh, Michael, Michael Chang from SUSE uh, uh, fixed some issues. Uh, which uh, appeared if you buy, if you use uh, latest GCCs, I think about nine and ten to build the crop, and uh, also Patrick Strehan together with Daniel Axens uh, uh, fixed uh, uh, different issues which were uh, which were popping up if you use uh, Clang uh, ten. So currently you are able to build uh, the grab uh, using the latest uh, and the latest compilers. All patches currently are in and uh, scheduled to uh, be released uh, with 2.06. Uh, as I said earlier, Patrick Steinhardt uh, introduced Lux2 support. Currently it is, it is in grab upstream. Uh, we are you know, uh, working on some minor fixes and pol polishing the code before the release. Uh, but uh, you, uh, currently you can, you can use it. Mm, uh, and uh, also we had uh, 2.04 uh, release, uh, release uh, 
uh, uh, last year. And also we had uh, many fixes and cleanups, including uh, tons of cleanups uh, for boot hole, uh, boot hole work. I think it is worth discussing at this point uh, the boot hole of how this happened and um, what we were doing during, during uh, uh, fixing this, uh, this issue. So I think that was uh, the biggest ish, uh, security issue up until now. Uh, it was supported at the beginning of April by Nikki uh, and Jesse, both working for, 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 uh, for Eclipse. And the problem was in Grab uh, uh, security uh, parser. Fortunately, it was quite easy to fix. The fix was uh, a simple one-liner, one but uh, we started uh, asking uh, questions ourselves. Uh, do we, are we sure that we do not have other issues in the Grab which should be fixed in, the, in this round of security uh, fixes? And it, we quickly realized that uh, uh, we have uh, a, a lot of issues in, the, uh, in many different place, uh, uh, places. Uh, they were usually related to uh, integer over, overflows. Uh, we also had some uh, use after free issues and other, other, um, other problems. In general, we fixed uh, integer overflows by using special functions provi provided by uh, a uh, compilers, uh, math functions, which returns mm, the information uh, is is there overflow or not. Uh, so you can check um, mm, the results of, of, of your calculations and um, fail sa safely if there is an overflow. Uh, so it is, it is very nice. Mm, unfortunately, we had to bump the version of, 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 of the compiler. Uh, this uh, led to some uh, uh, to some problems for some distros, uh, older distros, which are using older compilers, because they had to uh, take uh, uh, the math function implementation from from other sources, for example, from Linux kernel. Um, so this was not perfect solution, but we decided to, uh, uh, to do that because we think that it is much safer to uh, uh, rely on something which is uh, well tested by uh, compilers developer and um, it is much, much easier to use. But I think this will not make more issues in the future. Um, it is worth also mentioning that we quite quickly realized that uh, mm, the fixing of, of all found issues in the crab uh, will not be uh, would not be complete. We realized that we have to uh, provide some fixes to the shim. Uh, we have to, to change the mm, 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 or suggest how the uh, the uh, signing process should look like to uh, to uh, various artifacts. I mean by artifacts the shim, the crab, uh, the Linux kernel. And also, we had to do uh, revocations of all shims, which allowed uh, you to grow, uh, uh, load broken graphs on UFI uh, uh, platforms with Secure Boot Enable. So uh, this this was a huge uh, challenge. Even I think in some cases uh, it was uh, bigger than fixing uh, the grab issues. Um, for example, we discussed very long how to sign how to sign uh, efficiently all the artifacts and to not make uh, difficulties uh, in the future if you need, if we need to revoke some uh, uh, some um, uh, some signatures or something like that uh, so uh, we came up with some proposals um, uh, at least if i remember correctly three proposals how to, how to deal with that and uh, every major distro uh, stick to uh, uh, one of the most convenient uh, version of this of this proposal. Uh, so finally, um, we had uh, um, a few fixes uh, for 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 Shim for for Linux kernel. We provided twenty eight patches uh, for for the grab uh, for grab itself. Uh, so I think it's quite uh, a big set of patches fixing various uh, various issues. Uh, there were around 100 people uh, from 18 companies working on fixes all these issues. 
uh, we had uh, weekly calls to discuss uh, how to deal with uh, with uh, gap issues uh, also with, uh, with uh, signing issues so it was huge effort from organi uh, not only from technical point of view but also from the organizational point of view in some cases also it required some discussion with uh, legal departments because uh, we had to check that uh, the uh, licenses uh, are compatible between GAP upstream and, for example, uh, with the code uh, for math functions, which was pulled uh, uh, out from, from other, other sources. So it was huge effort. It took four months, months to uh, fix all these issues. But I think that uh, we all uh, did a very good job. Uh, we fixed all known, uh, known issues and uh, uh, nothing uh, uh, was leaked. So we were able to assure our customers that uh, um, the, the information about the issue was released together with uh, the fixes for uh, all, all the issues. I think it is worth uh, looking at least uh, three articles. I listed uh, three uh, links to the uh, different uh, articles which are looking at the, at, um, at our work from different from different uh, perspective so at the beginning it is worth mentioning uh, uh, a clipsum article about the boot hole itself it discusses the boot hole issue from technical mostly technical point of uh, point of view Another uh, link uh, leads you to the my email, which contains um, the list of all, of all patches uh, for the grab, but also uh, uh, lists all CVEs which were fixed uh, in, in, in the grab. And also this article contains some links uh, uh, to the uh, CVEs or articles which were available uh, uh, during um, um, disclosure uh, at, at disclosure at disclosure day. And uh, last link leads you to the article which I prepared with my colleagues. Uh, it uh, looks at uh, uh, boot call work from a, a, a bit different angle. In general, it discusses how we deal with, with the issue from organizational point of view. It also mentions some uh, legal considerations and also how we did uh, a communication over the secure channels and also Git, uh, for example, Git comments, uh, reviews, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that these three articles cover different, uh, uh, different uh, areas and so uh, the issue from different uh, per, uh, perspective. So I, th I think that um, it is worth uh, reading them. Okay, so let's move on to what is happening right now. Uh, as I said, currently we are uh, at, uh, uh, we are preparing for GRAB 2.06 release. Uh, it is strongly delayed, mostly due to boot hole issue, which, uh, pulled a lot of uh, people uh, to the to the to the work on the on the boot hole issue so we were not, we were not able to look after grab devel etc et so, um, so uh, it is as i said it is delayed uh, we we are in code freeze now i think that uh, i reviewed most patches which should be taken into uh, 2.06 uh, I'm going to discuss with Alex and uh, with Vladimir what should be taken and uh, and what should be fixed before uh, before RC one. I think that we will be able to release RC one by the end of November, maybe earlier, and then release uh, Grab by the end of December. It is also worth mentioning that uh, we are quite closely cooperate with Trendboot project. Uh, Trendboard project it is an DRTM uh, in implementation, uh, which is currently uh, uh, under development. It consists of at least uh, three main components. One is the bootloader, another one is MLE kernel, um, and uh, the third one is uh, yield uh, yield code, which uh, use is uh, which is used as a, an init RD which is integrated in into MLE 
into a melee kernel. Uh, in general, Oracle focuses on uh, Linux kernel, uh, uh, Emily kernel development with Intel TXT uh, implementation. Uh, Ross Philipson from Oracle posted uh, at least three uh, version of, of patches on, uh, on a Linux kernel ma mailing list. Currently, uh, there is a discussion going on uh, around TPM driver because uh, uh, TPM uh, uh, driver maintainers ask us to use as much uh, uh, code uh, uh, existing in the Linux kernel in the uh, Intel TXT implementation. In, the problem is that we have to use this TPM driver in early uh, Linux kernel code and uh, currently TPM drivers are only in kernel proper. So we have to pull out some some code and pull it in into into early code. It is quite difficult. We tried to do that in, in a few times. Uh, I hope that we'll manage to do that uh, this time. Uh, in general, uh, Intel and Oracle currently are working on Intel TXT implementation uh, for for Grab two. Uh, I posted a, an RFC uh, at the beginning of May, and we are planning to release next version of the patches after the uh, Grab 2.06 release. Uh, Freeland Web uh, is working on AMD SK init implementation uh, in parallel. Uh, it will be based on Intel TXT one. In general, the idea is to use uh, um, to create as much as possible uh, 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 the common code for, for the DRTM. Uh, initial goal is to, to have this common, uh, common code uh, for x86, but I hope that in the future we'll be also use this on other platforms which uh, support uh, DRTM. Uh, we'll see how it works. Currently, Red Hat is forward porting to the Grab upstream patches carried by uh, Red Hat and Fedora. This is uh, a huge uh, uh, work because the difference between uh, uh, upstream and uh, and uh, distros in some cases is over 100 patches. But uh, we realize that. Uh, uh, we will be able to drop around 50 custom patches uh, uh, from the Red Hat and Fedora after Grab 2.06 release. Uh, so this is, I think, a huge, uh, a huge, a huge achievement. And uh, this is, this work was done mostly by Javier Martinez, and I would like to thank you him for do, uh, doing uh, doing this. I hope that we'll be able to uh, to remove next uh, um, set of patches uh, before uh, next release. Uh, here also, I would like to encourage other distributions to do the same, uh, to drop uh, uh, the custom the custom patches from the, from the releases. And finally, this way, at some point, we'll be able to. Uh, have uh, all distributions as as close as possible to the upstream, and this will uh, is uh, grab some, uh, grab upstream life and distros life. So this is this is the plan. I'm happy that this is currently happening. Uh, it took some time to 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 make it happen. Uh, we are also planning to post next version of the firmware and bootloader log specification. Uh, and this uh, thing I discussed during Linux Plumbers conference, and uh, I, I uh, discussed uh, uh, why we decided to uh, prepare this uh, this specification and uh, what our what our go go goals are. And uh, I was uh, quite surprised that there is a lot of interest in, in this in this func functionality. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I will be posting the next version. Probably it will be used uh, in the shim. Um, and also, uh, I hope that uh, uh, if there is a lot of interest in this in this feature, it will be uh, put in some uh, official uh, specification on, on standard. So I'm not sure where, but in general, uh, 
the goal is to have this uh, uh, as much as possible architecture at platform agnostic. Uh, Art and Atish currently are working on VFI uh, load file two protocol Ninja B loader for Linux. This is this is another very interesting project because currently, at least for x86 and other UFI platforms, we have uh, different uh, Linux lo uh, loaders. In general, ARM, ARM and uh, RISC-V uh, uh, use uh, UFI calls to load and execute uh, Linux image, but this is not the case uh, in on x86 x86 uh, uses uh, own boot protocol, uh, which is completely different and does, doesn't rely on uh, UFI calls. Uh, so, uh, very ARM and risk V that they use something similar is more of a coincidence. Linux uses disparate protocols on different uh, systems, like PowerPC is completely different from what you have on x86, for example. Yeah, sure, but uh, but uh, I'm uh, talking mostly about UFI, and uh, in general, the unification will be in, on U in UFI area. I'm aware that uh, we'll be we'll have different uh, um, protocols for non-UFI platforms. Uh, the goal is to unify the protocol for UFI itself, and I hope that, that it will happen. Uh, so th this is this is the goal. Uh, Daniel Axtens was also on appended signatures. The goal is here to have um, support for something which is similar to UFI secu uh, secure boot functionality, uh, but uh, on the platforms which doesn't uh, have an, uh, an UFI firmware, an UFI compatible firmware. So uh, initially it is, uh, for example, targeted to power, uh, power platforms. I hope that it, it will be merged into 2.06 um, uh, release. And uh, Red Hat also plans to use uh, Linux KXEC to load uh, another OS uh, from, from the grab. Uh, this is a bigger project and I think it will be implemented a bit, a bit later, but we discussed this in, in initially. And uh, I think that this can be quite controversial. Uh, we are planning to admit officially that GrabUp Steam does not support small ampere gaps on uh, x86 PC, uh, PC targets. To some extent, this can be painful for some distros due to a shortage of simple mechanism, uh, integration mechanism to newer partition layouts, for example, GPT. Uh, however, uh, we are not able to cut endlessly arbitrary code from core image. This, this is this is this is the problem, and this this is the main issue which we we are not able to overcome. So at the beginning, we are going to implement some code which uh, will only allow uh, install a minimal core image uh, in some cases, and additionally, we would like. Uh, to add some uh, some documentation into into the grab uh, docs. Currently, we are discussing uh, how to do that. Uh, Vladimir posted uh, the patches. I think that uh, shortly I will I will merge them. Uh, so this will uh, this the, the first step, let's say, will land into 2.06. And after this release, we'll be discussing how to uh, go with this uh, further. As I said, this is a difficult problem. I'm aware of it. But uh, I think that finally we have to admit that uh, small ambient gaps are not supported. And uh, also, I would say that if what is clear is that small ambient gaps with complex layouts are certainly not supported and should have never been. Uh, but um, uh, what will happen with simple cases and uh, short time BR gaps is still up to discussion. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Vladimir, for this ambition. Yes, that, that's right. Uh, and also, we are working on other interesting features uh, uh, and additions to the, to the, to the grab. Uh, you can find all, all, all these discussions on the grab, grab the bar. So what are my, my pain, pain points? In general, the problem is that, uh, as you may saw on the grab as well, the, our throughput is 
and we're not very, very big and we are trying to, to improve that and to decrease response delay for emails i hope that in following three weeks i will be uh, able to some extent to achieve that uh, but uh, we are also looking for other um, people who have some experiences in different uh, technical areas uh, to take a look at, at the patches uh, which are, pe are appearing on, on, on GraphDevel. Uh, it, uh, uh, every um, every uh, person looking at the patches help, uh, help us to understand the code and, or, or catch some issues because sometimes uh, we are only people. We can we can miss some uh, uh, some issues in the patches and merge uh, uh, merge these patches and do not find these issues before that. So just to simply we will introduce uh, bugs too. Uh, so we want to avoid that as much as possible, and we are asking uh, you guys for he uh, for help. Uh, we also working on improving overall cooperation with distributions and other distributed patches. I think that to some extent uh, we achieved uh, uh, that goal. Currently, we are in touch with uh, Fedora, Red Hat, Debian, and uh, Ubuntu uh, maintainers, and I hope that we will be tightening this cooperation. Uh, this helps uh, us uh, a lot because we are uh, able to understand their needs and to help um, uh, them uh, to solve different different problems in, in the app scene. Uh, and there are also two issues which I think that at this point less severe. Some people are, po uh, are, are posting the patches and drop the work in the no middle. Uh, this doesn't help. Um, problem is that maintainers spend their time reviewing and nothing comes out of it. So simply we waste our time and lose quite interesting uh, features, pixels, clean, cleanups. And uh, the additional problem is that maintainers are, are too busy to take over uh, uh, all, all, all this work. Sometimes we try to do that. And sometimes if I see something interesting, I will pick this patch and I, I will put, uh, uh, repost it myself, but I'm not able to do, do that for all, the, all, all that kind of, uh, of patches. Uh, also, sometimes uh, it appears that people do not uh, carefully read maintainers comments and uh, post patches without taking uh, these comments in, into the account. This is the problem because uh, we have to ask again and again for doing this or that. I am, I'm able to understand that uh, uh, some uh, developers may not agree with our point of view um, uh, and uh, I'm happy if they express that on the mailing list and we try to hammer out better solution or, or, or and, uh, and compromise for 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 for, 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 a, for a given uh, a, a given given issue but uh, I encourage you to do uh, to do this uh, to make this discussion on grab uh, grab developer and do not uh, skip uh, silently uh, our comments. This uh, this will uh, this will help for sure. Also, I can can add that it's uh, all, all, most of the points that we mentioned on the review I can be compromised upon. It's uh, it's uh, still quite imp because uh, because there may be reasons for doing this this or that way that we cannot not read from the mind of the person posting the patch. Yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, last one but not least, uh, this also happens less often right now. I think that uh, if you start work on the new feature, please do that uh, group. Uh, please do that on the grab upstream instead of uh, instead of a specific uh, distro version. If you do that, uh, uh, otherwise you simply increase backlog and uh, make life more difficult for us as upstream maintainers and also for this uh, grab distro maintainers. So um, this is very important that uh, 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 you develop a feature on grab upstream. Also, if you are looking for uh, for some problems in the grab and you would like to re uh, report. Uh, um, uh, some issues uh, on the grab uh, upstream uh, on grab devel, then please do that research on 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 uh, on grab up, 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 upstream. If you uh, would like to focus on grab and on a specific distro grab, 
then please report these issues and directly to the distributions because uh, as I said, some distributions car uh, carry a lot of uh, custom patches and some issues simply does not apply to the, uh, to the grab up scheme. Okay, I think that's it. And I would like uh, at this point to start discussion and would like to get some um, input, input from you guys. What do you think uh, about our plans? Uh, what do you expect from, uh, from the project? I think uh, one of the reasons why you have so many bugs for, while often it happens that the bug which is introduced in the district gets reported back to us, is that we have at the bottom of our tools an email updated, even so they introduce significant patches. Okay. So the people basically do what they were told to do. <laughs> okay, uh, I have a question about the current ongoing work. Um, you mentioned about not supporting certain sectors of master boot record and shrinking the core image. Uh, how is this related, uh, for example, to the possibility of implementing a TPM uh, a legacy interface uh, in the master boot record and the core image? Uh, put, putting TPM into into short MBR gap is, a, is not supported. And basically the, basically, the only thing which is supported with short MBR gap is a, a MBR or GPT or well, GPT is actually different. Using M MBR BR plus BIOS disk plus simple file system. If you need something like TPM or signature or whatever, give us more space because it's uh, because now it might fit, but it's uh, certainly not something that we want to maintain. Okay. Um, possibly you may know about the trusted grab uh, project that. Uh, implemented uh, this TPM legacy interface there. And uh, as I recall correctly, they uh, dropped the uh, support for floppy in the master boot record gap, and uh, they managed to fill these uh, calls to BIOS TPM interface. I, I, I have, a, I know that something like this is possible. I have a, fitted in a single sector in MBR, even the checking against SHA1 hash embedded inside the same sector is fully possible. It's just not something that you, you want to maintain for a serious project because uh, you, M even though MBR does not change itself a lot, you still sometimes need to do some adjustments. And uh, if you don't have much of the space left in it, it's not ideal. Okay, so what would be um, uh, what would be the possibilities to have uh, the TPM interface implemented in Grab? To what extent would it uh, be acceptable? Uh, it's if uh, if you give us uh, the correct uh, MBR gaps, then there shouldn't be any problem. I think that there are two two approaches. Uh, the problem with a uh, small MBR gap is that you are not able to put all the code which is needed to the TPM because you need also the other drivers. So I think that there are two approaches here. Uh, Vladimir, correct me if I'm wrong. One is that you can use uh, around one megabyte MBR gap to do that. Another is that you can use GPT layout to do that with BIOS boot partition. We have, for example, one megabyte, and then you are able to fit all this code, TPM code, including drivers for disk, etc., and etc. So I think this 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 uh, approach is acceptable. Am I right? um, okay, because um, as far as I know, the the uh, first uh, five hundred and twelve uh, bytes is measured by the should be measured by the BIOS, so. Then we have the uh, this this master boot record uh, should measure the next uh, image that is executed. So it would be this one megabyte gap. Are you talking about uh, Daniel? I think. Yes. Yeah. So yes, with one MBR... megabyte, we have we have plenty of space. Sure, but um, I'm I'm wondering whether we would fit some 
certain calls in this uh, master butcher card. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's fine yeah. because um, you, there is some codes that you, you do not care about in uh, such setups. setups. First of all, you do not care about floppy specific code. Well, floppy specific code is actually a bad example. First, you have you we, we actually if you look at the layout of our mbr then we have a space reserved for the fat uh, fat structures and the space reserved for for partitioning table and the thing is that we don't care where we install to we always those both two spaces are unused yes. so it's easy to say is that like if you install with tpm we put tpm or code is there instead then also another thing that you you never use on dpm enabled systems is chs addressing so can, do you know what chs is yeah, yeah, yeah i know i know what it means cinder heads and, and sectors yeah, yeah. And, and since it's a, such an old addressing system you you can say that if you have a TPM enabled system, we will not even try it and use the space for the TPM calls instead. Uh, my understanding, Michal, is that you are going to use uh, some uh, BIOS calls to do uh, measurements. So I think that if you are uh, going to do that, uh, then it is quite easy because these um, int instructions are quite small. So I think that you are be, you'll be able to fit all these measurements into yes. Uh, um, yeah. As far as I know, for example, yeah, C CBIOS has the interrupt calls for TPM, and it even does the hash calculation. So I think we just pass the address of the block and its size, which should be measured. And for example, the PCR number and everything is handled by the uh, interrupt routine. I think that in both cases, in, in case of uh, a big MDR grab and also in BIOS boot partition, it's quite easy because you just need to give at the, at the beginning of, of, of this region and the size of this region. So I think that it, it, will, it will not require much space to uh, write the, the code uh, which measures this region, I think. Yeah, I think uh, it's, even, it's even after you have loaded to this additional code, you just pass the pathway you have loaded it and the size of what you have loaded. Yes, right. Um, implementation aside, but uh, what would be the acceptable, uh, or would it be acceptable to put uh, these few uh, instructions there? But uh, you, said, you said, Vladimir, that it would uh, not be accepted and not supported. Uh, I think that what, hap what happened is actually a confusion between two different terms, between MBR and MBR gap. Yeah. So what I thought what you meant is, that is putting a, a TPM module, module for which speaks with, with, with TPM chip itself with full implementation inside of MBR gap. No, no, no. I mean to use the uh, legacy interrupt interface to TPM. Yeah, and you you meant it by, by using it in MBR, which is the whole thing is completely different. Okay, maybe yeah. I have uh, expressed myself uh, incorrectly. So I mean to just use the interrupt calls to to BIOS in the MBR. Yeah, we, yeah, we can have alternative MBR for TP, TPM. That's no problem, and which will have those calls. Sure, that's cool. That's what I wanted to hear, actually. So, Thank so, you. So, so in general, we need two components, I think. This uh, and one is the uh, uh, functionality is which is in the MBR graph. In sorry, not in the recap, <laughs> in MBR, uh, which uses uh, interrupts to measure uh, uh, the code in ambiguous gap on in BIOS boot partition. And then we have to, uh, uh, let's say, full-blown implementation in the gap itself to do further measurements. You may either have uh, a, stand, a standalone uh, grab module for TPM, or yeah. you may still use the uh, BIOS interface. Yes. With the interrupts still. Correct. Yeah, sure. 
That's okay. up to you. Can, up to you. Or you can have, or you can have a model which uses uh, bias interface. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is what Michal is saying. Yes, exactly. So it's in the grab, we, there are two possible ways. If you are, if we, we are in the grab, we are able to use interrupt calls on the legacy platform, or use uh, 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 the driver which directly access to the TPM. Yes, and we have entrenched with the TPM library, so it could be easily pulled if the license allows that. It's, you well, have all the working code there. I think that we, um, we do not require. Um, does it require a lot of things to implement uh, uh, the measurement in in, uh, uh, in the TPM? I haven't. No, the, the measurement API is already there. So, uh, one thing you would have to do is to, for example, write to the event log if you desire. Oh, the event log is much more difficult thing. That's why I asked. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. From that's from that's what? not uh, that's, uh, simple. Yes, but uh, you have uh, the interface for TPM1 and and also TPM2, all the commands, etc. From what uh, I learned from reading the source for the TPM, you basically have to access it through LPC and then ju just send the commands of the hashes that you have uh, computed. Uh, yes, I, either LPC or MMIO in case of CRB interface. Mm. So it, it depends. I'm not familiar with BRB. Not, uh, um, but TIS also uh, uh, access uh, uh, over MMIO, as I remember. Do you have the yes, yes, yes. The these memory cycles are routed to LPC. Oh, okay. Okay, guys. Like um, you have very into you have like Daniel. You had a very interesting presentation. Like quite a lot of things. I'm. As I said, it would be great that um, if um, all the features or the new features got like some documentation or some introduction, like how people can leverage that, because this is, in my opinion, important thing. Uh, but from my perspective, uh, getting back to Michal presentation, I wonder about integrity checks, like how we can, um, like how hard it would be, or maybe I'm missing something. Uh, to have integrity checks of the downloaded files for booting. Let's say like he tried to get the kernel, get the int rd. Um, I would like to check it's implemented and how I can use that in the config. Uh, you, you basically have to ship uh, uh, ship uh, is a, sig a signing certificate um, with, with the grub image itself. And then uh, in the config, you say that I that I I trust trust this certificate and enable the enforcing of the signatures, and then the grub will refuse to load any files which do not have a valid signature. Uh, so you are, my understanding is Vladimir that you are talking about PGP support in the grub, uh, which is currently implemented, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, there there is uh, there is also uh, I think about the. Integrity verification by hash, right? We don't do not have yeah. to necessarily check the integrity via the signature. We have also hashes. Uh, mm, most yeah. how, how do you check hashes? You, uh, yeah, you that's, may... that's what we're asking for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's another problem. For example, uh, you can have a mirror that uh, hosts also the SHA two hundred fifty six, for example, of the files, and you may uh, locally also calculate the hash of what you have downloaded and try to compare at least it may give you uh, a, a certain um, level of certainty that what have you downloaded is correct so mm, not 100 percent but still I, I would say like like that so i believe like a couple times uh, i probably downloaded something what was uh, broken uh, and i to be honest i didn't download hold the file or there was some some transfer problems and I just don't want to boot something that is broken. Uh, so I should check integrity of that if I can. Uh, that's kind of like, seems to be intuitive for me uh, to have that feature. Uh, we can, uh, you can probably, uh, it's, I think there was a, also a feature request for this, uh, but yeah, you can, uh, it's probably quite, it's, uh, not that difficult to implement uh, 
meant it you by using um, uh, by using verification framework. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it would basically act the same way as a detached signature with only the difference that instead of, de of verifying it as a signature, we just verify the hash and it would be in text format. Okay, okay. So Sounds most of the reasonable. code is there. Mm -hmm. What so, about, yeah. Of course, the, of course, there is also problem of uh, secure transmission of this the, this this hashes. If you are doing this in uh, in trusted network, this is not a problem. But uh, I think he that doesn't uh, actually. His question is not about cryptographic verification. It's about uh, basically layman's verifications that I downloaded it correctly. Uh, yeah, that's 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 correct. So it, the, for this thing, is I think it is it is, it is, it is sufficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the HTTPS? Like at some point we had that discussion. Uh, do you consider HTTPS, or is there like maybe I'm missing something and it's already uh, there? What what we mean what we need for HTTPS first and foremost is security source, and the, and that's a big problem because unless you have a good security good random number no not security process you have a, you need a random number generator so unless you have a good random number generator your security is completely useless you may remember debian security fiasco from uh, about 15 years ago when maybe not even maybe even less i remember but i think that uh, currently the situation uh, um, i think to some extent looks better because some uh, cpus provide uh, uh, some instructions which which can provide you uh, uh, yeah but uh, the, the source. daniel daniel uh, tpm should provide the yes you can also use tpm if you have a, uh, have a platform it, yes. it should require a lot of instructions to to get this uh, do all tpms provide random numbers all yeah, the, this TPM, is a standard. This is standard. They must. Uh, they are pretty slow, but I think for the grab it should be sufficient. Yes, and also uh, there were some uh, vulnerabilities with the TPM random number generators and and stuff. For example, Roca vulnerability, and uh, for example, some Infineon TPMs uh, were generating quite weak uh, uh, random numbers and. As a result, the keys uh, could be uh, recalculated. So, so anyway, it's not always a good source of trust, but it's still better than CPU instructions, I think, because CPUs okay. are more buggy than these TPMs. I am not sure. I would uh, say I would expect uh, CPUs to use some quantum process. <laughs> I'm not sure how it is how it is uh, how it is done. There were some speculations uh, how uh, Intel is implemented, and um, some do not trust into this implementation. But yeah, I think that... especially especially when you can patch microcode right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that it um, uh, it is much better to use uh, uh, this instruction or the, the TPM e even if even if some cases uh, these sources can be unreliable. But it is better than use uh, own uh, generation method or something like that. Uh, the problem is that basically, if you generate a run, if you do the same thing as GPX does by using static number, then uh, is then your entire communication with the server is actually just pretty much sorted with a predictable yeah. pattern. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And uh, it's uh, the problem is that it gives false sense of security for everyone. Yeah, yeah that's and, a terrible mistake. Anyway, True. I think that at the, um, to some extent it is quite easy to implement the, uh, the random gener generator in graph. And we actually we looked it into, into it a couple of times and uh, so far we have decide, decided it not being worth it so we need basically someone who is willing to put effort into it and we need to find a, a suitable random number generator it will probably be, have uh, something to do like uh, like uh, using using two different timers 
like one of the source of source of randomness that we already have and we discard is when you're calibrating liberating your TSC timer based on either PM timer or pitch timer, you you actually have some low low bits which are pretty much random and just depend on how interrupts uh, happen to be. Yeah. But also the TPM Robert. should be a good source of the uh, random numbers because uh, Microsoft uh, requires right now the TPM2 to be present, right? So most of the hardware should have some kind of TPM, either firmware TPM or a discrete one. Even either even way, this is becoming yeah. more and more common. Even TPM 1.2 supports a random generator. So yes, even this is currently TPM, I think, in the latest machines are, are common. Uh, and I would say that uh, just look at all the random number generator, random number sources we have, like uh, some timer shenanigans, TPM and CPU instructions, then put, concatenate them, throw them through some, um, some hash and add, add some um, key derivation function. And or, then it, or yes, give some salt, et cetera. Yeah, yeah or use, use something like Yarrow, published by Bruce Schneier. So if if you mix them or good together using good known algorithm, you should be fine. Yeah. Because even if one of them is weak, still it doesn't, because you for to get anything meaningful, you would have to not only to weaken the, weaken the security characteristics of one source, but you would also have to weaken the hash functions and the other sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, last try of switching the discussion in, in different direction. Uh, so like um, we have this like getting back with to the K exec and K exec kind of is everywhere and everyone in the area of the bootloaders talking about the K exec. Like um, IBM, like openly saying that this is uh, their way of doing things. So Pet Petit Boot uh, use it. There is um, work on KExec, um, and there are some patches. And I believe Daniel is an KExec expert also. Um, so I wonder what's the future of KExec, and especially in context of security, uh, how we plan to manage to keep the uh, white support for booting various operating systems through Grab uh, with with this approach because right now, of course, this makes sense only for Linux. Uh, but do you see any potential for other operating systems like BSD? I think it is uh, possible because uh, right now, how we do booting on non KExec is it does not um, not consider it has actually pretty abstract functions because. What the problem that we had in the past is that different kinds of firmware would use different um, different spaces, spaces of memory. And like traditionally, you would load the Linux at one megabyte mark, but then some EFI implementations, they use this one megabyte mark for some boot services. And so you cannot load into them unless you, you, you trash boot services. And so we we have a framework where you just say, I as a boot, as a handover time, I need this chunk located at this address, and then it will either is a place it there direct there immediately if it's possible, or it will put it in a in some temporary buffer and copy whenever needed. And what you can do is basically modify it in a way that it, instead, instead of giving, spitting out uh, these instructions, it would make an, a, a small ELF file with all those segments and a, sh a short stub, which will put the, the registers of what they need to be. And then say k exec load this stub. Okay. Okay. That's that's interesting approach, and I see like you are positive about that about uh, KExec moving forward uh, in the grab, and then um... I think it's an it's an interesting experiment at very least. 
And as far as I can tell, at least uh, partial implementation of KXE support is an, in Red Hat. I'm not sure about that. If you, uh, I see. I think they have some some partial stuff, but it does not use the same the things that I described, which uh, would be which is not which we will probably which will certainly need more work. Uh, I think that we can use the KXE itself directly. Uh, for for loading need... Linux, yes, but if you want to learn, load other the kernels, you need you need this machine. Mm, at least for multi boot, uh, it is also possible to download directly. Yes, I agree. To some extent, you probably will need some stuff to to to, for example, to load uh, Windows. I'm not sure. I think that. Um, at some point, Google did KXEC uh, working with Windows. I'm not sure how they did that. But uh, yes, they did that, and they uh, just Im uh, imitated uh, the UFI services and replaced uh, the uh, data it should, the Windows bootloader should receive when it calls the UFI services. And okay. that is why yeah, how they booted. Uh, yeah, but there are interesting. So this was done by Chris Koch uh, when he was mm -hmm. and and uh, one of his uh, interns. Uh, to be honest, the most was by intern. But uh, Chris uh, presented that on um, platform security summit and also uh, things moving forward very fast with uh, uh, with KXEC. There are new people coming to the idea. There is even channel dedicated to that approach. So one, there are many strategies how to handle that, and one of the strategy is kind of like kind of uh, complex, but uh, means um, uh, having a VM in which you have UFI services, and then uh, you just redirect uh, any UFI services call to this VM, and anything else going. This is like a Linux boot, uh, Linux boot approach, uh, but I'm I'm seeing that. Like Grab thinking about KXEC, and there are like many people, like so IBM doing that in Petit Boot. So it's not like a uh, niche idea. This is like very popular idea across the board. So we will see how this will go on. I know there is signature verification. I, I, I yes. believe it's already implemented. It is implemented for, uh, there are two, currently there are two KXEC calls. One is um, legacy call. Uh, which does not support signatures, and another is uh, new, uh, how it called, file call or something like that. Take the file which supports uh, X509 signatures, but I'm not able to provide some more details about that. Okay. You just pass, uh, you just pass uh, if you want to verify the signature of, of a given uh, kernel. You have to add a special option to KXEC command to do that. And then uh, different uh, syscall is used to, to execute uh, KXEC. OK. OK. Oh, maybe I have one question uh, regarding the boot hole. You have uh, listed all the companies that cooperated with uh, fixing this issue. Um, as a firmware engineer, I often maybe pay too much attention to firmware related companies. But I saw uh, there was uh, American Megatrends uh, from the independent BIOS vendors, but I haven't seen a Phoenix or Insight. Uh, did they cooperate in any uh, mm, at any point? Nope, nope, only, <laughs> only AMI. Great, so I, I now wonder how uh, their firmware security uh, looks like now with the boot hole. I'm not sure. Uh, in, in general, the firmware, uh, where the firmware folks were most interested in uh, the BX updates, which is publicly uh, publicly available on the UFI website. So they have to merge in their releases in uh, uh, DBX. Uh, as as far as I can tell, they did not care much about the issues in Shim. Uh, grab and all other things. They mostly uh, um, were looking for 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 DBX updates, which were critical critical in fixing uh, this issue. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, so we have some comments uh, from Andrew uh, from Andrew Cooper. He's saying that um, if we distrust RDRAND uh, instruction, we are already doomed. Uh, so, so um, yeah, so this, Why? Is, this is. <laughs> Yeah, I believe like if Wendy will be here, then he will explain us that. Uh, but I believe like if we, you know, like uh, we had this situation when RDRAND uh, had some problems, like I believe uh, AMD uh, implementation had some problems. But anyway, um, like this is his comment. Um, and then Christian mentioned uh, that ROCA does not affect random number generator. Uh, it only affects key, de key generation. Uh, um, for which prime numbers must be used, and but I think I, I had idea like I thought that uh, a random number gener generator is supporting the prime number, um, like looking for prime number, yeah, for big prime, num prime numbers. That's what mm -hmm. I thought too. <laughs> yeah, yes, usually, but it's quite possible for uh, it's able to screw up one without screwing up the other. Mm -hmm. Yes, with regards to the uh, AMD issue with random number generator, it was quite uh, awkward uh, and another buggy UFI stuff uh, because uh, the random number gen generator for AMD is supplied by the PSP. And uh, during the, uh, uh, the resume path, the random number generator wasn't reinitialized uh, by the UFI, so it was broken after the suspect. No. That was the history of I recall collectory. Okay, <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> yes. But, uh, it's, and uh, uh, distrusting this or that instruction CPU is nothing new. Remember Pentium division bug, uh, remember long, long so, uh, lock, lock up and so on. There are so many bugs in the CPUs. But, well, I, I don't live that long to remember that. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I yeah, remember. so so I, I don't think we can avoid bugs in um, in some uh, weird locations and bugs like hardware bugs or bugs that lead to patching microcode or patching um, and uh, execution in a man management engine. Like it's very hard to, for us uh, to affect that. What we can do is kind of. Um, mitigate that, maybe try to isolate from that. Uh, I don't think if we have any power of, of changing that at this point. Uh, maybe supporting the hackers, uh, the, uh, the hacker community, uh, the people that reverse that and then look, okay, how this is built and promoting open source firmware, promoting open culture. Uh, so that may uh, support, uh, you know, more auditable code and probably less bugs. Okay, guys, uh, I believe uh, we should wrap up. Um, I, I'm, I really appreciate uh, your attendance today. Um, I hope uh, uh, we can we can talk uh, next week. Uh, PH Coder, I don't know if you can attend next week. I can. Yeah, that's great. So uh, like, feel invited. Uh, it, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, Daniel, thank you for your presentation. Michal, thank you for your um, debugging and looking in the network stack of Grab and uh, talk to you next week thank you very much and thank, thank everyone for watching you. Bye. Yeah. thank you thank bye. you very bye much guys. everybody bye. see ya